Good morning, and welcome to worship at Grace United Church in Sarnia, Ontario, an affirming ministry of the United Church of Canada. My name is Pat Morrison, and I'm the minister here at Grace, and very much proud to serve among the people of Grace, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, and who strive to be an inclusive, intergenerational community partner. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which I stand is the traditional territory of the Chippewa, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Delaware nations. These are the first to agree to the mutual sharing of the land with responsibilities and obligations to the environment. And today, these responsibilities and obligations extend to all peoples. Let's take a moment to orient ourselves. I invite you now to consider the place where you are to be a sacred place, and that this screen where we gather might be our sanctuary. So take a moment to collect yourself, to recall the week that was, and to consider the week that is to come and to carry both of these with you into our time of worship. So take a moment to center yourself as Glenn offers up the first gift of worship on our behalf. This past week was Rendezvous, which is the United Church of Canada's National Triennial Conference. And the event, of course, was virtual and online, and saw participation from around the globe. Our denominational partners from uh, the United Church of Christ, from as far away as the Philippines, and many other global partners from other countries around the globe. I got to lead worship each of the four days of this event alongside this guy named Kenji. Together we were moved to be part of this virus that is very much alive and spanning the globe. To hear the works of of justice and compassion, programs 
birthed and driven by young people, inspired by their faith in Jesus Christ. It was a great reminder that we are part of something that is way bigger than us, way bigger than Grace United Church, bigger than the United Church of Canada, or any denomination. Not defined by location or epoch, but by spirit. And it is that spirit that brings us together this morning. So, so come, let's join with our siblings in the faith from around the globe who celebrate Sunday, the Lord's Day. Let's gather together to worship. Come, let us worship God as revealed in Jesus Christ. It's a powerful thing, peace. The past few weeks, as we read through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is, is swarmed by people desperate for peace. People encounter Jesus and they sense that there is something available to them through this guy. They get a taste of it and they grasp for more. Even his disciples, caught in a storm, look to Jesus and desperately grasp for peace. And again, 
in this morning's scripture passage, people of all nations are grasping desperately for this peace that emanates from Jesus. And no different from the present day. So taking inventory on the faces on your screen, take a walk around our virtual sanctuary and imagine offering each other the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. As our passage will suggest, sometimes it takes an adult who is willing to go to Jesus and fall to their knees for the sake of a child, that the child's life might be saved. Take a moment to think of an adult in your life who had faith enough and care enough to hold you up before God. And as you recall that person, I invite you to offer thanks to God for intersecting your life with this saint. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge, our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. This morning's scripture from the Gospel of Matthew is yet another brilliant passage that pushes his political and religious agenda. Matthew introduces us to a, uh, a believing Gentile woman who stands in stark contrast to the unbelieving Pharisees and scribes from the preceding chapters. So Matthew borrows this story from Mark to weigh in on a debate that preceded them both. The debate is around precisely this, to whom does this Jesus belong? It's brilliant. It's a brilliant passage for its political and cultural um, nuance, and it's clever Christo-apologetic, and certainly more than what we can touch on here. But beyond clever and brilliant, and, and more importantly, and always, Matthew writes to speak to the human heart and to tune us into a different currency, always. And this passage is no different. So let's listen now as Regan reads this passage for us. A 
reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Listen for the urging of God. From there, Jesus took a trip to Tyre and Sidon. They had hardly arrived when a Canaanite woman came down from the hills and pleaded, Mercy, Master, son of David, my daughter is cruelly afflicted by an evil spirit. Jesus ignored her. The disciples came and complained. Now she's bothering us. Would you please take care of her? She's driving us crazy. Jesus refused, telling him, I've got my hands full dealing with the lost sheep of Israel. Then the woman came back to Jesus, went to her knees and begged, Master, help me. He said, it's not right to take bread out of children's mouths and throw it to dogs. She was quick. You're right, Master, but beggar dogs do get scraps from the Master's table. Jesus gave in. Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. Right then, her daughter became well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. An interesting passage this morning, a unique passage in that Jesus is seemingly um, and strikingly uh, rude, dismissive, even human. This troubling interaction with the Canaanite woman has so few details. The dialogue is, is very sharp, but sparse, making it hard to get a read, or leaving a huge gap for interpreters. Scholars offer many possible interpretations for Jesus' demeanor toward this woman. Some suggest the passage is inauthentic meaning the author places these words in Jesus mouth in order to push his own anti-gentile agenda and then Matthew takes hold of the story and adds the change of heart twist at the end to support his own pro-gentile agenda some scholars suggest that the passage is in fact authentic meaning Jesus actually spoke these words, but that in context, Jesus' words aren't as harsh as us moderns might think. That it's no more offensive than the modern maxim, charity begins at home. And still other scholars suggest that we should simply accept the story as it stands, in all of its harshness, as it accurately portrays the chauvinistic, anti-Gentile stance of the day. Nonetheless, regardless of which school of thought grabs you, interpretation of the passage is challenging for its gaps we know that something happened in that exchange that changed Jesus' mind. And what that something is, we don't know. Matthew, perhaps intentionally, leaves it for us to fill in the gap. The good work of any parable happens when the mind wrestles with possibilities and stumbles upon a beautiful truth. So what is in that gap, that unscripted space? If we, if we could get a hold of something that lies in that gap, we might catch a glimpse of the currency of the kingdom, that stuff that is sacred, you know, real substance, that landscape where the human meets the divine. So Jesus refuses. I've got my hands full 
dealing with the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman persists on her knees, begging, Master, help me. Again, Jesus dismisses. It's not right to take bread out of the mouths of children and throw it to the dogs. And then, here are the bookends that define the gap. She responds, But even beggar dogs get scraps from the master's table. And Jesus gives in, Woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. Nope. Yep. What happened in between the hard and fast nope and the yes? What happened in that gap? What do we see in that space? What is the substance that triggers the granting of healing? Of the few words that she even spoke, what was the catalyst? What in this woman's orientation might offer us a hint? What is the substance that transforms nope into yep? Again, the beauty of a parable. The mind grasps for something, anything, that might help make sense of it. We try on different interpretations and we play with it in our minds to see if a truth might play out. We may go further to experiment with it, to live into it, to test it as true. But firstly, what we do is see what we might find in that gap. Here's what I see. I see a woman desperate for release, for freedom. I see a Canaanite woman grasping desperately for release for her daughter, from the terrorization of demons and, and release for her daughter from the resultant social isolation. I see a woman desperate for release for herself from the terror and isolation and many forms of poverty attached to claiming such a child as her own. I see a Canaanite woman brazenly crossing hard and fast boundaries, culturally embedded, clearly defined, unambiguous, ethnically and religiously based social boundaries in order to get face time with this wandering Jewish, non-Canaanite male teacher and healer. I see a woman that doesn't mind elbowing past the disciples to bring her plight to Jesus, believing with all her might, as any good mother does, that freedom should be available to her child. I see a woman with every determination claiming freedom for my child, freedom for my daughter. And there's no good reason for the withholding of freedom from my child. If there's freedom that answers the human condition, then there is no acceptable rationale for the dismissal of my child and her plight. Whatever you call that, that stance, that insistence, that knowing, that assuredness. Whatever you call that, that's what I see in the gap. The insistence that freedom belongs even to this child. The woman knowing that this freedom is hers to claim, even as a woman, 
even as a Canaanite woman, the assuredness that Jesus is the one able to grant freedom even to a Canaanite. Whatever you call that, that's what I see in the gap. And let's call that faith. The work of the parable has begun. And we may go further to experiment with this or any other interpretation to live into it and to test it as true. What child do you claim as your own? What freedom do you claim for your child? And what is it that your life is desperately grasping for? May God grant us faith. Amen. What is faith yeah. about for you? Yeah. How do we get it? How do we get more of it? Yeah, I know. Talk to me about it. You faith. know, I'm really enamored right I now with Catholic <laughs> theologian James Allison, if you've ever read his stuff. At the Wild Goose Festival this summer, I, I listened to a lecture from him and it blew my mind. And he talked about faith being relaxing in the way that you relax in the presence of somebody that you're certain is fond of you. Right? When you're in the presence of someone you're certain is fond of you, you're funnier, you're like spontaneous, you feel free, time might go by and you don't even know it. Allison talks about faith being in the presence of God and being in God's presence in the way that we can completely relax. That's very related to the Lutheran idea that faith is trusting God's promises. It's not intellectually assenting to a set of theological propositions. Mm -hmm. Uh, faith is trusting that we are who God says we are, that God's promises um, are, are being fulfilled among us, even if we're not seeing it. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Habakkuk is about this week, actually. <laughs> I mean, Habakkuk was like, look, you know, you keep saying this, this thing is going to happen and I'm not seeing it, but, but the righteous, not a moral category, by the way, right. the righteous are people who trust that God... God's promises uh, come to fruition, and we live in this trust of that. So, I mean, to me, I think that's faith. Mm -hmm. Also, faith is not, I don't think faith is given in sufficient quantity to individuals. I think it's given in sufficient quantity to communities. Um, and so that whole thing that God, God will not give you more than you can handle, I think it's like, my husband's from Texas, so he said it's like, God won't give you more than y'all can handle. You know? <laughs> and so this... Um, I mean, faith is a team sport. It's not this individual competition, right? And I think people can be tormented by like going, I don't feel like I have enough faith. I feel like I should believe, my belief should be stronger. But it's kind of like with the creed, um, people say, well, I can't say the creed because I just don't know if I believe every line. I'm like, oh my God, who believes every line of the creed? I mean, I'm so <laughs> In a large group of people, for each line of the creed, someone believes it. So you're in comfort, right? Because it's not my creed, it's the church's creed, you know? So, I mean, I think we're, this Western individualism that we have has been has sort of run, run amok in religion, where, where it's all about the individual and what how much faith do I have and, you know, my personal relationship. And it's like, it's really about the community in a lot of ways to me. And I also think, you know, we're, we're writing our constitution, we're going to become an organized con organized congregation of the ELCA, um, and there's this thing about receiving members and they have to make a statement of faith, and we wrote, we're writing in our constitution that a statement of, we consider a statement of faith to be participating in the liturgy and receiving the Eucharist. That's a statement of faith. Let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let us pray. God of freedom, you know the ways in which we grasp desperately 
for release. And so you gift us with faith, the mother of hope. We know that faith is knowing we are never without hope. We know that faith is our choice. We know that faith begins with Jesus, with an insistence, a knowing, an assuredness. So we bring to you our children of all ages, children who live in all forms of terror, needing release, children who live in all forms of isolation, needing comfort, children who live in all forms of desperation, needing freedom. And we bring to you, God, the specific names of your children of all ages, whom we deeply love. We pray for Curtis and Tracy, Jerry, Doreen, Dorothy, Doug, Donna and Lauren, Gloria, Gail and Earl, and all those we name silently to you now. And God, hear our prayer as we unite our voices with your church around the globe and across the centuries. In the prayer your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. living truth 
Go into the world to fulfill your high calling as disciples of Jesus Christ, living in the knowing that freedom is available through Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>